Advocacy Chat, um, Director of Public Policy at BLCT. And with me today is Gwyn Zakoff, our Municipal Policy Advocate. And we have quite a few of you um, joining us. We're delighted about that. Uh, so Lisa Goodell and Jim Burke are going to keep the Zoom aspect of things going smoothly. They're also going to watch for questions. Um, you can either raise your hand to pose a question or put a question in the chat. And we do hope that this is a conversation after we run through the issues that we're going to cover today. And to that point, we're going to be talking about uh, the items that were raised in the last legislative report and um, a couple of other issues that have arisen since then. The legislature did dive right in and uh, they're not wasting any time whatsoever. So after Glenn and I run through the, the topics that we wanted to bring to your attention, then we'll open it for questions. Please do unmute yourself or raise your hand if you want to speak. And um, we, as I mentioned before, we'll, we, mon we will monitor the chat for questions as well. And then for those of you, you um, most of you probably are already aware, but you can go to legislature.vermont.gov to, to watch any of the committee proceedings, also the action on the House and Senate floor at any time if you want and it's very accessible now because it's all remote. So let's see. So I'm going to start off today talking about the education tax, the revenues and the tax structure commission report. The tax structure commission draft report was put out um, about three weeks ago the comments were due on that report uh, as of the 21st, which was last Thursday. We did provide pretty substantial comments to the Tax Structure Commission, and I'm actually going to be discussing that with them this afternoon at two o'clock. The, the VLCT board at their meeting last Thursday endorsed the Tax Structure Commission report, recognizing that it's an opportunity, really the best opportunity we've had in quite a few years to assess the way the education fund is put together and the over-reliance on the property tax that is part of that education fund. It pays for um, about two thirds of the education fund and the education property tax is the backstop. So if other funds are not coming through the way they should, the law is written so that the property tax picks up the slack and makes up the difference between what you need to pay for all the school budgets that are passed and what um, is available. So uh, that's the, very short version of the Tax Structure Commission report. They also look at sales tax, corporate income tax, and, and the, the entire revenue structure that we have in the state. Um, and hopefully the Ways and Means Committee will take that up in some detail um, going forward. The next thing that we talked about last week and, and really is pretty interesting is that revenues are way ahead of what the legislature had projected revenues would be back in August. And that's largely due to the fact that we've gotten um, more than our fair share of federal CARES Act funding and um, CAA, Con Consolidated Appropriations Act funding, um, from the federal government. It's also worth noting that Senator Leahy is now gonna be a chair of the Appropriations Committee. He's also President Pro Tem of the Senate. And Senator Sanders, who may not be wearing his mittens all the time, um, is going to be chair of the Budget Committee. So we're very well situated on the Senate side to, to have some significant input into what happens going forward with the federal budget. And I will also say that both Senator Sanders and Senator Leahy have been very attentive to the issue of 
needing to provide direct aid to states and municipalities as part of whatever um, next relief package comes from the federal government. So we're hopeful on that front as well. Really what has driven our revenues um, being way up is the sales tax. And the, um, the sales tax has just skyrocketed due to online sales. So that's not really particularly good um, news for our downtowns and our struggling businesses, but it is good news from the revenue perspective. And we also put a little plug in um, on Friday for towns. If you haven't actually thought about a local option sales tax, it might be time to do that because I guarantee that those UPS trucks and FedEx trucks that are driving around the roads in your town and delivering packages, um, that's a potential revenue source that might offset uh, some of the property taxes that you need to raise on the municipal side. Um, so we would just sort of put that in as something to think about in your community. Let's see. Um, the, uh, the one area that, that, is not, um, that is not doing so well, and we've seen this for quite some time, is the transportation fund. So transportation fund revenues are up right now, but the long-term trend is that uh, those revenues are gonna decline because we base our uh, transportation fund largely on gasoline taxes and, and fuel taxes. And those are gonna be going down as people shift to public transportation, to non-motorized transportation um, and to electric vehicles and just overall uh, driving less. So there, there have been numerous studies done over the last several years around what to do about the transportation fund and how to balance it. And that's a conversation that's um, going to be very important for local governments going forward. And I don't know that it's one that, that the transportation committees have started to take up yet, but they certainly will. Um, let's see. So I am going to uh, turn it over to Gwen right now to talk about cannabis and um, the potential for changes to that legislation that'll affect local governments. Thank you, Karen. Um, cannabis, um, if you want a synopsis of what I'm gonna cover right now, it's um, in our legislative report. So I'm just gonna go over essentially what I um, already wrote about. The um, Senate Government Operations Committee took up uh, the first cannabis bill of the session. It is um, a bill, uh, S25 is the number if you're interested in looking it up. It would make you know, miscellaneous changes to the underlying, um, uh, underlying statute that um, was passed last year in um, Act 162. There is one provision, uh, section one of the bill that has the um, most impact to municipalities. And it has to do with the uh, voter approval or the opt-in um, of voters to allow retail establishments in their communities. So everyone who's followed this issue is probably aware right now, last year, the legislature um, sort of split off what cannabis establishments would require voter approval um, and which ones were um, just allowed across the board. And essentially how it is, is um, all establishments are allowed in all communities, except for retail establishments that um, and those retail establishments um, would only be allowed in a community if voters are um, approve of them um, at a special or annual meeting. This bill would mandate that on no later than March 1st, 2022, that all municipalities have to place a ballot question before their voters 
and ask them whether they would allow cannabis establishments, retail establishments in their towns. So uh, we, I testified on this um, uh, last week. We have some uh, significant concerns with changing um, the game so early before the game has even started. Um, the Cannabis Control Board has not even been, has not even been set up yet. Um, they're pretty, f I shouldn't say far behind, but it's, it's, it's appearing because of what's going on in the world and in Vermont in general, that the timeline that was put forth in the legislation last year is really ambitious. And it's very interesting that they would even try to accelerate it even more by mandating that all towns weigh in on this um, so early. And um, it seems a little tone deaf given the fact that a lot of communities are struggling to even figure out their annual meeting for this year, let alone having such significant um, issues of policy put before the voters. Um, I made it clear to the committee that we do not support this. Um, we don't see necessarily the point of having it. Um, there seems to be no problem that they're trying to solve. Um, we haven't even had a community yet put it before their voters because we haven't had our annual meetings yet. I know there will be communities that have it on the ballot um, and others that are strongly considering it. So the committee did say that they were open to changing the date and pushing it further back. And that March 1st, 2022 seemed a little too soon, which is clear again, because <laughs> the by March 1st, 2022, we won't even have the rules promulgated from the um, Cannabis Control Board that towns and cities will have to essentially live by when they come when it comes to licensing at the local level and rules and regulations that they'll have to adhere to. So um, they didn't say that they would drop the proposal altogether, but they were interested in um, pushing the date further back. Um, so the committee chair was interested in hearing from communities, um, not just necessarily on the opt in, opt out, or the sort of the timing of putting a vote before voters, but more um, about the entire picture of cannabis in communities. Um, the Senate is very uh, supportive of, um, especially in that committee, they're supportive of revenue sharing and a local tax for um, cannabis sales, um, which we um, are uh, agree with and support. And um, so we have an ally in that committee for sure, um, to some degree, and they seem very um, interested in hearing uh, local communities reasoning for either wanting to have establishments, not wanting to have establishments, um, uh, feeling like a opt-in uh, vote is better done this year, next year, later on, um, what their, you know, just their overall concerns. So I would encourage anyone on the call or anyone who knows anyone in your municipality um, that's an official um, who wants to testify or is interested in weighing in to contact me um, or the committee chair um, and the committee assistant in Senate government operations. So um, they don't, didn't have a date set forth for when they were going to take up testimony. They said in a couple weeks. So it might be another few weeks before they take it up again. It doesn't seem to be a, a huge high priority, um, but it's something to flag and it's an opportunity for not, again, not just the uh, voter approval mandate, but also other, other issues put before um, communities. It's an opportunity for you to talk about it um, to a, a committee that is very receptive to local needs. So I think I've got the cannabis covered. I'm gonna hand it back off to Karen. All right, thank you, Gwen. So um, I wanted to touch just a moment on the um, tax expenditures report that was presented to the Ways and Means Committee and Finance Committee last week. And that's a report that goes through all the exemptions from different taxes um, that are on the books in uh, Vermont, including the property tax. Uh, and it go and it actually summarize what summarizes what the cost is of those um, exemptions on the revenue source. One of the issues that got raised in the tax expenditures report was tax increment financing. 
it um, is not actually an exemption because if there is new development in a community that has a TIF, then that new property tax revenue is recirculated in the, in the community uh, to pay for infrastructure that will spur economic growth and, and now help in economic recovery for, for those towns that have TIFs. Um, the, the tax expenditure report said that this cost the education fund about $5.76 million um, in revenue that's not going directly to the education fund right now. That revenue will go to the education fund when the TIFs are finished. It is generating significant new development dollars um, in those communities that have TIFs. If any of you have been to Winooski, you just need to look at Winooski's downtown since they've had a TIF um, to see what the benefit there is. St. Albans is another really good example. Um, the, the Ways and Means Committee has never liked TIF and there's really no way to sugarcoat that. But um, the, the administration is actually proposing and they did propose last year and we supported a mini TIF program that would let smaller communities use the same kind of mechanism for an individual project. So if you're in a smaller town that has a village center and you would like to um, grow that village center, but you need wastewater capacity because you don't have a wastewater system right now, this mini TIF might help you pay for that kind of development. So we've supported both the TIF obviously in the larger communities and the mini TIF. And we've tried very hard to make the case that um, those developments and that investment in infrastructure when there aren't a lot of other resources around really will benefit not only the communities but the state in the long term. That's going to be clearly a, a conversation again this year. It's going to be part of the conversation around the tax commission tax structure commission report as well. Um, let's see. Uh, and then I also wanted to mention before we get off the subject of money that the governor's budget was delayed last week because he had to go into quarantine and the um, budget is now going to be tomorrow afternoon, I believe at two o'clock, but tomorrow afternoon and after that, we'll have a much better picture of what is being proposed by the administration in terms of how to fund um, the state government going forward, as well as, of course, what kinds of monies might be coming to local governments. So uh, that is the end of the money thing for right now. And I think, uh, Gwen, you're gonna talk about public safety Sure, I'll go over briefly um, the, this is a, an executive order. Um, many of you might have uh, heard about some of the executive orders, not just done at the federal level <laughs> with the new president, but um, at the state level. And, and one of the executive orders that was issued from um, the governor uh, just last week has to do, um, it's executive order number 1-21, and this is an order that would create an agency of public safety. Now, I, I, we wanted to flag this um, for everyone um, just because it does have, um, even though it's a state agency creation, um, it will have um, sort of an umbrella impact over you know, other um, municipal interests as well and things that impact municipalities. So right now we have um, our, the, the public safety um, entity at the state level is, is, is not an agency, it's, it's a department. It's the Department of Public, of, to public Safety. And for years and years and years, there's been a push um, that ha obviously hasn't gone far, um, but, and it's actually um, supported by um, the chair of the Senate Government Operations Committee and several others to create an agency rather than a department. And, um, it has not moved far, um, 
beyond that committee in the legislature over the years. And um, there's been a push and a, and a, and a, um, a um, desire to move this issue forward, uh, especially when there's so much going on in terms of um, public safety reorganization and some of the, the issues that public safety entities across the state are, are dealing with. And the order, basically what it does, it, it creates a, um, a timeline and an implementation of when a agency is created. And it brings in, and, and some of you may know or may not know, there um, are many public safety officials, um, whether it's fire or um, law enforcement, this really doesn't impact EMS, but really it's more law enforcement and fire um, that are beyond just the Department of Public Safety. You have the, the state troopers, you have the uh, law enforcement officials that work for DMV, who are obviously in the Department of Transportation. You have those that work for Fish and Wildlife that are game wardens, um, even corrections officers that are um, uh, that are certified as law enforcement officials. And so you have all this sort of um, uh, uh, many different departments or different agencies with law enforcement, but there's no sort of um, glue to keep them together. And um, what the agency model would do is basically over the next year or so is bring it under one umbrella. And um, it would impact bringing under, um, other than those state departments and agencies, it would bring in things like the um, Vermont um, Police Academy and the Vermont Criminal Justice Council and the Vermont E911 board. So those are all things that you might be familiar with that impact municipalities. Um, it would bring them under the umbrella of, of, of the agency. Now the autonomy of those um, entities would be would remain to you know a certain degree, but what it would provide is better access to administration, like administrative um, tools, to resources, to technology, to communications. It sort of like um, dismantles the silos um, that are in play right now. And um, the governor issued the order last week um, on the agenda for the House Government Operations Committee this week. It's most of the week it looks like so far, they're going to be taking up this executive order. Um, uh, you know, I'm not an expert on executive orders <laughs> and um, what this is trying to do, but essentially the governor is sort of pushing the issue in front of the legislature saying, look, I have authority under my governor's powers to change um, the executive branch to a certain degree. And it's up to the legislature to basically say no thereafter. So um, right now, um, it, he's basically waiting for the legislature to take it up and, and see um, whether or not they disapprove of his creation of an agency model. And so the um, VLCT board of directors took up this issue, I believe two months ago, I might be wrong, but um, there was unanimous support um, of this model. I think there's a, an understanding at all levels that the, 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 the better that the, um, the better state entity that is set up, the, uh, it, 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 it impacts the um, county level sheriffs and our municipal departments as well. Um, and is helpful to um, just create better coordination and administration across the board. So there is support and VLCT will testify in support of creating an agency model. And that covers that. I'm gonna hand it back off to Karen. And I don't know what you're talking about, guns, I think maybe. So there, there are a few issues that are coming up this week in the legislature that we wanted to touch on for you. Um, but before I go there, the interesting thing is that um, about executive orders is that in Vermont, um, the governor can issue an executive order and then uh, the legislature can essentially overturn that. They can disapprove it. There's a lot of controversy and actually a court case right now about whether it would take one chamber or both chambers of the legislature to overturn an executive order. But um, that's the way it works in Vermont. At the federal level, Congress cannot overturn a presidential executive order. They can enact a law that essentially negates it, um, or it can be deemed unconstitutional through the courts, but there's not the same kind of check on the federal um, level that there is at the state level, which I don't know, I find to be kind of fascinating. Um, but speaking 
of executive orders, the other executive order was the governor proposing to move Act 250 over to the Agency of Natural Resources, essentially. And that was taken up in the House and Senate Natural Resources Committees last week, initially. Um, the House Committee at least sounds like it, it is not at all supportive of that proposal, even though it's been discussed for years. And a couple of times the model that um, has come out of that committee has recommended a very similar construct going forward. But we're going to hear a lot more about Act 250 in the in the next several weeks out of the House Natural Resources Committee. They are also going to put forth um, a bill that sounds like it might be very close to the huge bill that they put forth last year and that in the end, um, very little action was taken on it. Well, it was, was disapproved. So, um, lots more to come on Act 250. What we have really wanted to see happen in Act 250 is that if you have a designated downtown or new growth center, or um, I forget what the other one is, or, or a new neighborhood, uh, that you've done a lot of homework already to get those approvals, and uh, Act 250 should not apply in those uh, areas of your community. And, and that is a way to uh, get rid of some significant regulatory duplication and uh, make it easier to build or develop in those places where we have said as a state that we want development to occur. There are a couple of other bills that are getting taken up uh, this week. The Senate Judiciary Committee, as Gwen mentioned, is going to be looking at a bill that would prohibit guns in public governmental buildings, hospitals, and um, child care facilities, unless the child care facility is in a home. The Vermont League of Cities and Towns board voted to support that at their meeting last week. Uh, I'm going to testify on that bill tomorrow afternoon, not tomorrow afternoon, excuse me, Wednesday afternoon. Wednesday morning, it's already a crazy week. So, um, and the, our, our board wanted to make very sure that the bill was specific about public um, buildings that are governmental buildings, not any public building, because of course, if you have a multi-family, multi-unit family building or apartments or a, a lot of businesses, those are all um, public buildings under the law, but they're not governmental. The bill also talks about essential functions. And um, if that term stays in the bill, we think it's pretty important to define exactly what is meant by those essential functions. The other bill that we're going to be asked to talk about this week is a broadband bill. And as you know, people continue to struggle with internet service, high-speed internet service on our front porch forum this weekend. There was a very long rant about consolidated communications. And I'm just going to say it wasn't put up by me. But um, so the it remains a huge issue in large parts of town. And one of the things that the House Energy and Technology Committee is thinking about is if you have a communications union district that's trying to actually build out fiber to underserved areas, that that might be tax exempt from the property tax for a certain period of time, or that you might, um, that towns might be able to opt in to exempt those, uh, that fiber that's laid or some version of that to, to uh, encourage the building of fiber to the, to the last mile in those underserved areas. One thing that we had suggested just in conversation last week is over in Maine, they're actually using tax increment financing to invest in the fiber infrastructure and, and use that as a um, means to actually fund some of those developments. 
So those are some of the issues that are coming up this week. Of course, the Senate Natural Resources Committee in particular has been looking at water issues. I see that um, several of the people on this call are uh, from our public uh, utility departments. And um, those conversations are going to be going ahead, um, continued, and we need to pay very close attention to a whole number of issues around water quality, wastewater, um, paying arrearages, all those kinds of issues. So, uh, Gwen, I, I don't know if you had anything to add before we go to questions. And I apologize, I'm on a phone, so I can't actually see everybody who might be um, raising their hand or putting something in the chat. Uh, no, Karen, I think we we pretty much covered it. Um, there are a couple other things that were in the ledge report, but um, you can read all about it there. Um, there's no the reason. I mean, there, uh, the House Government Operations Committee was taking up elections procedures, um, sort of a debriefing of what happened in the um, primary and general election. Um, it was great. It was really well attended. There's no bill, you know, yet. There's just um, discussions with the Secretary of State's office and, and city and town clerks to figure out what lessons were learned. Um, and uh, we'll obviously have a lot more lessons learned as towns are heading into their um, annual meetings this year as well. So um, stay tuned for, for that. Um, and yeah, I mean, there's plenty. We've already put plenty in before you. It's only the beginning, it was three weeks in and we already have a lot of this. What's fascinating by um, these virtual meetings is that things move really, 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 really fast in the legislature now. So um, they're definitely up and running, so. Are there, does anybody have any questions or comments or um, things you wish would happen in the legislature this year? Just raise your hand, unmute yourself and break in or however works for you. Wow. Karen, I, this is Shirley from Williston. I'm curious, I know there was some discussion about possibly having the Vermont Tax Department take back over the billing of the education tax. Anything more come about on that? Um, they have a report that they're supposed to deliver to the legislature. I'm not sure um, what the date was that they were supposed to deliver it by, but there were a couple of hundred reports that came in on January 15th. So we need to go through that list. Um, we had supported moving billing and collection to the tax department. Um, the clerks association had not taken a position on that because they uh, had yet to talk to you know, a sufficient number of their members about whether they would support that or not. I don't really know what the tax department is um, going to have in their report, but maybe next time we meet, or I'll put it in the newsletter this week for you. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, and the Ways and Means Committee and some of the things I listened to last week, Karen, they, the committee, um, the House Ways and Means Committee did bring up that issue. Nothing in terms of a, you know, a position or moving forward with it, but it's definitely on the forefront of their minds when it comes to talking about the property tax in general and ways to improve it. So it's not um, it's not a one and done. They didn't they didn't lose that idea. It's still it's still um, resonating in the com in the committee room. Yeah, it was not a very popular idea in the Senate Finance Committee, which is the counterpart in the Senate. Um, and at, as I recall, the conversation in the Ways and Means Committee. It was proposed as potentially a way to address education property tax this year, but of course it doesn't get to the main issue. So hopefully they won't um, just leave their conversation at that level. Do we have anything else for me? Sasha. Sasha has a question. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah. Um, this is Sasha Thayer from Plainfield. I'm chair of the select board. 
And I am wondering whether the legislature legislators are aware that the Connecticut Attorney's Title Insurance Company has sued nine towns and come forward with a theory that our town clerks and municipal um, uh, employees should conduct themselves and, and open the offices in the same manner as prior to COVID-19. And if so, I mean, I would love to see some kind of legislation that clarifies that our our employees and our elected officials do not need to fear putting themselves at risk of death in order to be considered to be performing adequately. Any, any update on that? Well, I did hear this morning that um, there's going to be a hearing at the Superior Court on Thursday at 8.30 in the morning. Um, I I'm don't know. I'm wondering about the legislators and the right, right, right. Because what, can, what the Connecticut Attorney's Title Insurance Corporation has contended is that I think it was the June 25th executive order requires town uh, clerks to keep their offices open just as if and to the same extent as if COVID-19 never happened. And I'm wondering whether legislators are even aware of this lawsuit and considering taking anything to protect our municipal employees and elected officials. Well, we, I mean, I don't wanna step ahead of you, Karen, but I know that um, our, we have a very different legal opinion and interpretation of the law. And certainly the governor who's issuing the orders has a very different legal opinion. Um, so it's not really a legislative issue because as far as we're concerned, the, the state law and statute that's been there for a very, very long time says that the hours of operations are set by the town. And then you add on that the extra level of the executive order and the governor and the executive branch saying that um, operations of you know an XYZ sort of uh, makeup have to operate under a certain, um, uh, operate by certain measures. So um, the legislature, there are members in the House Government Operations Committee and um, Senate Government Operations Committee who are aware of this and they too are waiting to see whether or not this even um, goes anywhere. Um, it's also really interesting to me that the court system itself has been operating um, in a very different manner and um, they've had to change operations, including slowing down how they've um, received um, this, uh, these claims from the title insurers. Um, and yeah, so I, I, I have my own personal opinions about how I think the court's going to react, but we don't, we won't know, but the legislature is aware of it, but it, they really, the, uh, the laws on our side in terms of state law and statute and, um, the executive orders are far reaching and, um, the governor and the administration thinks that, um, they're on good, uh, good footing as well. So, there's not well, much for the legislature to do except for be aware of it. There's been a motion to dismiss filed, which has not been ruled on by the court. Yep. It is going to hearing and it's going to take a huge amount of time. Sure. Um, and, and obviously the Connecticut attorney's title insurance company, who we, which none of which we've gotten any complaints from, from any title uh, searchers, mind you, in Plainfield at least, um, they um, are arguing a completely different interpretation of the law, which is pretty much as I couched it. And so it's put a lot of, um, for a little town like Plainfield, where we have only one town clerk and an assistant town clerk, it's put a lot of pressure of feeling like what's, you know, like insanity is surrounding them sure. as well as, as concern that what could a court conceivably order, notwithstanding the fact that their operations are, <laughs> we're doing this hearing by web something or other, you know. Sure, but, um, yeah. I just would yeah. hope that there would be some clarity that, that because the um, Connecticut Attorney's Title Insurance Corp Company is citing a particular statute, that this doesn't mean that we have to put people in harm's way. Um, well, we 100% agree, but we won't know again until this moves forward. And the legislature is not going to act on something in pending legislation, particularly as it relates to not just that underlying law, but what the impact of what the executive order does. Um, as it relates to that law. I just think it's not going to happen until the, the court does oh, something. No. no, I wasn't expecting it to happen beforehand. I was just wondering whether anybody's concerned that there perhaps should be some clarity. Now, I'm a recovered attorney myself. And the other thing I think is this, unfortunately, this has not gotten a lot of play in the media, but attorneys already have a bad reputation. And to have the reputation that they're trying to get, you know, your neighbor town clerk to go into work when it's unsafe is, you know, not exactly the best uh, optic, but that doesn't seem to be um, affecting this Connecticut corporation. Anyway, thank you. 
Yeah, no, th th this is not a new issue. And what's really interesting about this is that, um, yeah, it's, it's a bigger issue, but the, the title and this goes back to probably way before I did anything municipal, but there's always been, um, I wouldn't say bad blood, but the title insurers have been very forceful about wanting to de to basically centralize, you know, land records. Um, and I've just be generally been displeased with the way um, town operations um, uh, are as it relates to um, access to deeds and land records with um, for their for their membership, you know, they're, they're looking out for their own self interest, but this goes back further than just and, it, and it's unfortunate that those towns were, you know, chosen mostly at random, it looks like. Um, but, you know, we're, we're aware of it and, and we're following it. And um, hopefully the court does the right thing. But if not, if there's something, you know, obviously if something bad happens where it, in, it infringes on town's ability to manage their own operations, um, we will absolutely be seeking legislative change for that. I mean, that's just a non-starter that would completely um, just upend operations in many towns across the state, um, considering that most of the towns um, are, are quite small and, and like you said, in Plainfield have, you know, um, limited um, personnel and space and um, benefits of technology and, and, and whatnot, so. Well, and the crazy thing for Plainfield is that they have received almost universally slathering thanks from people who've done title searches because they provided them with lots of materials without them having to come in the office. And so to get this lawsuit, which basically says you're a horrible human being because you're not doing what we want, is, is just kind of crazy making because uh, it's yeah. not their reality and in, in their day-to-day -day experiences with, with people who are searching titles or surveyors even. Yeah, so we might have time for one more question if uh, anybody has a question. And if not, I'll thank you all for coming and um, we will do this again in two weeks. So is there a, let's see, um, Ken has his hand up, Ken Lindsley. Could you unmute yourself, please? Or maybe your hands up by accident? By accident, yes. Oh, okay. <laughs> All right. Great. However, David Bronson has his hand up. Oh, okay. Go ahead, David. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay. Well, thank you. Thank you for this. It's been really interesting. This is like the first time I tried doing this, and at least my microphone is working, even if my camera isn't. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. All right. Well, thank you once again. And um, please send us any comments you might have. We both have emails that are in the legislative report. We'd love to hear from you. Uh, and if you're interested in weighing in in the legislature on any of those these issues, we will make sure that you get before the relevant committees. And we'll see you in two weeks. Thank, thank you. you, everybody.